Blackburn. Hello and welcome to the Burn KC Scorchcast. I am your host, Alex Blackburn, here to bring you the KC Sports News. Good, bad, and ugly. So, today, don't have a ton to talk about, but the stuff that I do have to talk about is really substantial. Um, we're going to go into some Kansas basketball, some Kansas State basketball, both men's and women's. Um, we're going to go into some college football moves, uh, Lance Lightbold stuff, you know, the um, certain contract that he signed this past week, as well as some combine results. And we've got a little bit of Chiefs news, not a ton, but like I said, some substantial conversations of the burning question, for example. And we've got a few minor things to look at, as well as the KC Current stuff. So strap in, sit tight, and enjoy the show. Let's get started. basketball moves. So, starting with the Kansas men's. Huge win last night um, against the Kansas State Wildcats. Huge win. Uh, much needed after the past couple of not very good losses. Uh, obviously, you had that one against Baylor and then your one home loss for the year against BYU, which shouldn't have happened. Uh, it was good to get back on track if you're Kansas. Um, Hunter Dickinson looked dominant, as dominant as he's been. The stats didn't really reflect it, but you could tell that you know Kansas State was focused on defending him because the rest of the guys just opened up and let loose. I mean, Dewan Harris was making his shots. Uh, Kevin McCuller really looked good. And shoot. Nick Timberlake had a career game last night. Um, the the Nick Timberlake that we saw at Towson. Um, I mean, he looked great. And to have a game like that and to have probably the best second half adjustments you've had all season is really encouraging because – that's hitting at the right time for Kansas um, because this coming Saturday, you've got a huge, 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 huge matchup against the Houston Cougars at Houston. Going into the Kansas State game, I was already worried about that game because of how, I mean, how, how badly Kansas has played on the road this year. I mean, it, they've played awful on the road, probably one of their worst seasons in the Bill Self era on the road. And I was ready to write this team off as forgettable. But now, if they can pull off the win against Houston, I think they're sitting pretty as title contenders. I do. And... You know, I'm not just saying that, well, you're a Kansas homer. Of course, you're going to say that. No, like, look at how, look at what the Chiefs did this year. Look at what the Chiefs did. Everybody wrote them off as, ah, they're going to get maybe to the divisional round and then fall apart. You know, they, they, they have no wide receiver core. Um, Patrick doesn't look as good as he's been in the past. Um, this defense is really the only thing holding this team up and holding this team together. Um, and they've had some pretty bad losses. And then going into playoffs, you know, they look dominant. I mean, they looked great. There wasn't really a game where you could say that, well, I mean, obviously you were worried because like there were close games, yes. But the Chiefs looked like the Chiefs. I think going in to March and hitting your stride in March is what's most important about the Kansas men's basketball team right now. 
And I think that's exactly what they're doing. And if, you know, you can have a really, really good game against Houston and beat them in their own house, that's huge. And then if you can carry that momentum into the Big 12 tournament and end up winning that, that's even bigger. I think if Kansas wins the Big 12 tournament, then they'll they'll be sitting super pretty for the title chase. That being said, you got to beat Houston first. I, I, I think you have to beat Houston in order to be looked at. And you could even, you know, lose to Houston and then win the Big 12 tournament. And people will still have doubts because you you can't finish on the road. You have to show that you're able to beat good teams on the road. Oklahoma does not count. Oklahoma may not even make the tournament after what we saw from them last night. And to see a Kansas team just roll like that shows you that when they're motivated, they're one of the best teams in the country, if not the best team in the country. But they have to be motivated. And I think Bill has them motivated. I think Bill Self has them motivated now. We'll see how Houston goes. Um, You know, obviously, Kansas already beat them in Allen, and they beat them pretty healthily. They beat them by 13. I don't think Houston is going to allow that to happen again. Houston's going to play their best ball. You have to come out and play your best ball as well. So it's going to be a tough game to gauge. I think it's going to be either very, very close or it's going to be a complete blowout. And I hate to say it, but I don't think that blowout will be in the Jayhawks' favor. So they have to keep it close. They have to come in motivated, and they have to come in and say, hey, we're the kings of the Big 12. We are not going to take this line down. We are here to show you why we were picked preseason number one. And I think they can do that. I think they showed that they can do that. And it was their most complete performance last night since the last Houston game. So in other words, you know, put up or shut up at this point, because a lot of people put are are still, putting this Kansas team in the, well, you know, it was nice being picked preseason number one, but all the things that happened, you know, the Arterio Morris situation, the scholarships, um, the NCAA stuff, et cetera, it was, was just too much, you know, second round exit is what, what I see for this team. I'm beginning to lean more towards, you know, maybe they will make it to the Sweet 16 Elite Eight Final Four. But they have to beat Houston first for them to fully convince me of that. Um, I know that I know that there's drama regarding the handshake between Bill Self and Jerome Tang. I'm not going to get into that. I think it's a non-issue. I think it's ridiculous, and I think it's just part of the you know big brother little brother rivalry that Kansas and Kansas State have. Uh, I think people are just pulling at straws to you know get angry at each other it, it's part of rivalry stuff if if you're not part of this rivalry you wouldn't understand um or you know if you've had stuff petty stuff like this happen in your own school's rivalries you probably would so it, it's essentially the same thing just people grabbing at straws to be angry at one another as for the kansas women's team The women's team looks really good. They are streaking right now. They're sitting pretty in the tournament chase. Um, They they have all but locked up their tournament spot, I think, especially with the win over Oklahoma on senior day. Um, They have a ton of talent. Tiana Jackson. um, Oh, what's her? Holly Kurzgeter. um, Samaya Moore. And and others just have looked absolutely spectacular this year. Um, and I, I think they have a great chance if they can keep this momentum up at making a deep run in the tournament. And with both Kansas teams sitting pretty, I'm happy. As a as again, 
a Kansas homer. I'm happy. I'm sorry my mic keeps doing this. I don't know why it does that. I think it's just because this is black. Everything's black here. I'm, st I'm still new to this whole green screen thing. Um, but overall, you know, the Kansas Jayhawks look good. Let's get into the K-State Wildcats, though. And if you're a Wildcat fan, I apologize. I'm about to just drag you. Um, again, I'm a Kansas homer. It's what I do. Kansas State looked awful last night. They looked so bad. And, uh, you know, Jerome Tang even said it himself. It was a pathetic effort. I mean, just one of their worst efforts of the season – they came in hooting and hollering, saying how they were going to spoil Kansas's senior night. And, you know, they beat them in Bramlage and beat them in Manhattan, blah, 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 blah. But when it came time to put up or shut up, you know, Tyler Perry scored as many points as Patrick Cassidy and Michael Jankovic. So, yeah. <laughs> It 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 uh didn't work out so well for them, I'd say. Um so their tourney chances are looking slim to none. I think unless they win the Big 12 tournament, uh, it's it's NIT. And even that, you know, is looking a bit a bit far fetched. <laughs> We'll we'll see how the NIT voters, I guess, are, are there voters? Is there a committee for the NIT? I think there is. Um, I wouldn't know. <laughs> um, but we'll see how the voters end up end up end up figuring that out because Tyler Perry, Arthur Kaluma, I mean, it, everybody looked just terrible. And, you know, I get it. You know, you're playing Kansas and Allen. That's not an easy task. And were the referees on Kansas' side a time or two? Yeah, but there's no excuse to lose by 23 and have one of your star players score as many points as, you know, the team manager <laughs> of Kansas. You know, that's that's inexcusable. I mean, ref, you know, the referees, I think we can all agree as a collective Big 12 fan base have been terrible this year. I agree that there were calls last night that probably should have gone Kansas State's way, but they didn't, one. And number two, you still lost by 20 plus points. So, hey. I, I honestly can't believe that Kansas even lost to them in Manhattan with how they looked last night. I mean, Kansas looked utterly dominant last night. And I think that says more about Kansas than it does Kansas State because I think Kansas State, you know, I don't think they had a bad game because they've struggled with turnovers um, throughout this season. They've struggled with you know, their star point, their star players being boomer bust guys. And it's been the story of the season for them because they were, again, they were picked to finish pretty high in the Big 12 standings. I had them finishing top three. And with how they've looked this season, I can't believe I did that. <laughs> And, you know, yeah, they lost a ton of talent. They lost Naquan Tomlin. They lost Keontae Johnson. They lost Marquise Noel. They still had solid replacements. I mean, Arthur Kaluma is no slouch. Tyler Perry is no slouch. David Gasson is decent when he wants to be. Like the, I mean, it looks terrible. And this season has been essentially a wash at this point. So, I mean, as far as, like, what now goes, does Jerome Tank stay? Do you see a mass exodus from Kansas State after a super disappointing season? And the, the, the way that this athletic department and this, you know, university administration has treated this basketball team, I mean, in, with regard to the whole Naquan Tomlin situation, I... 
it, it's it's a mystery. So we'll we'll see what happens. I mean, it's it's not looking good for Kansas State. I think it's a lot worse than a lot of people see it see it as. So as far as their women's team goes, though, uh, their women's team looks has looked solid this year. They've looked great, in fact. But they're skinning two right now. Um, you know, they lost to Kansas. Uh, they suffered another loss to, I believe, Iowa State. I believe. Or was it Baylor? I can't remember. Um, but they, they've they been skidding as well, and they're quickly losing momentum. And just like how Kansas is gaining momentum at the right time, Kansas State's losing momentum at the wrong time. Their women's team is, at least. And kind of their men's team, too. I mean, they were white hot when they played Kansas, when they played Kansas at home. But... You know, we've seen how that works out, how, how that's worked out now. Um, but, you know, they're they're still sitting pretty as like a two seed, I'd say, two or three seed. I don't see them falling any further, especially if they do well in the Big 12 tournament. Um, but you got to get this skin under control. And, you know, with the talent that you have on that roster and the, you know, experience that you have on that roster – I think they have the ability to do that to save their season, but it's going to take some work and it's going to take a good run at the big 12 tournament, which has a ton of great teams. I mean, the big 12 women's tournament is just as much of a gauntlet this year as the big 12 men's tournament is. I mean, there are so many good teams in the big 12 that you'll need to get past and that have had your number in the past. So it's time to put up or shut up for, for the Kansas state women's team and the Kansas men's team. So that's kind of the story of college basketball in the area this year. Let's talk some college football now. All right, let's talk some college football. Shall we uh, really we need to talk about Kansas because really hasn't been much going on with the other teams. Uh, I guess combine results, but you know, that's, that's pretty much the only news from the other teams, but regarding Kansas, um, if you read my articles regarding Lance Leipold, um, you kind of know what I'm about to get into, um, Lance Leipold's contract is showing how much Kansas cares about building their football. Um, And I went into it a little bit last week in last week's Scorchcast. That's huge with the way things are looking this uh, with, with the future of college athletics. I think we all knew that football is the moneymaker, you know, the head honcho, basically, of any college athletics department. Any college athletics department worth their salt, at least. I know that there are college, yeah, that there are colleges that don't have football teams and, you know, are still successful and, you know, more power to you. But, you look at the top program, the top athletics programs in the nation, and they all have football, and they all have pretty good football at that. Um, and I think Kansas wants to insert themselves, and you know, yes, basketball has been a staple of Kansas athletics for as long as the sport has been around, but. It's not the money maker, and you have to be making money in the money maker to, you know, keep up it, keep up with the Joneses essentially. Um, and I think Kansas is committed to doing that now. I don't think past administrations and te- past Kansas football teams have been 
have been doing that. I think past Kansas teams have, or past Kansas administrations really, because it's honestly been the administration's fault that football has taken such a seat, has taken a back burner um, at Kansas. I mean, you look at what Shehan Zanger did, you look at what Jeff Long did. I mean, it, just awful, awful, awful work to develop this football program. And it has set Kansas back. I mean, it's held Kansas back. Kansas could be one of the best athletics programs in the nation if they had just built football up. And they may have done it just in time given the age of NIL, the age of money mattering now more than ever in college athletics, and just overall reputation, too, mattering more. I mean, you see the rise of Alabama basketball and other, you know, athletics programs that you know, have had good football teams having right having rising programs outside of football because of what they've done at football so just overall this was a great move by Kansas made just in time um i shared an article on my twitter again go I hate to keep doing this. I really do. But the Burn Casey Twitter only has 37 followers. And then my personal Twitter only has 202. If you want to hear more of me, go follow, please. I, I'm not begging you, but I'm being shameless and promoting my social media because it's where I post a lot more news. And you don't have to just hear me yap. You can just see a tweet and just understand where I'm coming from and not be like, oh my gosh, this guy is unhinged. Um, <laughs> but maybe you'll still think that. But I, I shared an article on my Twitter from Mike Farrell Sports, and I wrote about it as well, obviously. But Mike Farrell Sports went into it pretty well and explains basically how Kansas has gotten their foot in the door regarding football at pretty much the exact opportune time. And I kind of delved into it a little more by saying, you know, this is the example of what athletics programs should be doing in regard to, you know, saving their skins in an era of conference realignment of, you know, NIL dealings and just overall, again, keeping up with the Joneses. We're looking at potential super conferences being built and those who are not included are going to get left in the dust. And Kansas, for a while, was going to be one of those one of those schools that would get left in the dust. And now that their football team is getting better, now that they're committed to the sport, I think that these, you know, the, this idea of super conferences isn't so scary to the university. And it's in its well-being of its athletics department, but also the university itself. I mean, athletics brings in a ton of money. It does. And I think what people need to recognize is that football brings in the majority of that money. So building your football program is imperative. And, you know, you can have donors for other things at your universities, you know, but when it comes to state universities in particular, 
athletics is your money maker and athletics is what it is going to attract most of those donors. So good on Kansas for finally caring about football um, as a football fan and a Kansas alum, as well as a fan. I am very proud of this program and I love to talk about them. If you haven't already, go check out my articles on college football dogs. Um, that's where I write about Kansas football. I do share them to the burn KC. Um, obviously it does not gain any traction toward the burn KC it gains traction towards college football dogs, but I still appreciate the read and you know, maybe it attracts people to the burn KC. I don't know. I don't know how many followers I've gained from my college football dogs articles. Um, I know it's been a few, but whatever um we're gonna go to the chiefs next actually we do have one more piece of college football news i need to talk about the combine results my apologies so let's go into the kansas guys first uh dominic pooney and austin booker so let's kind of go over because i didn't really hear much on the kansas guys um i Kind of saw measurements, but I knew the measurements more or less. Let me look. So, Austin Booker ran a 479 40-yard dash, which I think puts him in a relatively good spot. That's that's kind of that's pretty average, all things considered, um, for a defensive lineman. I, I would think, uh, you know, Austin Booker, he's, he's got a lot of speed with his hands. But work-wise, you know, there's there's a little bit to be desired, but, I mean, he's just incredibly strong. He's a little bit undersized, but overall, I mean, like, looking at these other stats here, his broad jump is in the top 77%. Uh, his vertical was okay. His 10 yard was okay. Um, his weight, he re obviously, you know, he's 240 pounds. He's going to need to put on a little more. Um, you know, his 40 was again above average. Um, and just overall, he's, he's probably about a three star prospect. He's probably going to go. Somewhere in the middle rounds, I'd say. Um, so PFF has him rated as an 84.7, which, you know, certainly isn't bad. But I think if he stayed a little longer at Kansas, he would definitely build into potentially a first day pick. Uh, I, I think he obviously, you know, won Big 12 Newcomer of the Year last year. He was looking really, really good. I, I really think he could have built a little more on that. Uh, as for Dominic Pooney, let's kind of go into him. Dominic Pooney had a solid combine, if I remember right. Um Let's kind of look into his details. So he scored. He's he's the tenth ranked guard, first and foremost. Guard. I thought he was a tackle. He he's an offensive lineman. I think so. A lot of people see him as a guy that is incredibly versatile, myself included. Uh, he's a little light, but overall he's, he's a good guy that could develop into an NFL starter. And he showed that in his combine results. I mean, you've got obviously a few of these – that are a little bit not great. His shuttle's incredible. It's a 4.4, .4, 
And for a big man, that's pretty dang good. Uh, his three cone, very good. Um, another one there. His 40 was pretty average. His 10 yard was not great. Um, and I think a lot of people, you know, can see him potentially starting, but overall, you know, he's he's gonna be another mid round guy. I think Kansas is you know, just happy to have some guys come off the board on the NFL, in the NFL draft. Uh, that hasn't been very common, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, is what it is. Let's look at some Kansas State guys. Um, so Kansas State had, I believe, three guys that went to the Combine. Uh, buh, 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 buh. Ben Sinnott was one of them, and if I remember correctly, he did okay. He did fairly decent. Um, so he's probably going to end up uh, just given his size. You know, he's 6'4", 250. He's a big dude. He's obviously, you know, played fullback, and he's played – tight end. He's played both positions pretty well throughout his college career. I think he has a chance to be a good starter. He's got a 40, he's got a 4 6 8 40 yard dash, which it certainly isn't terrible for a tight end. Um he hasn't he hadn't tested for the bench press. You know, overall he got an 80 on his scorecard. Uh comparatively speaking uh, Austin Booker got a 70 and Dominic Pooney got a 73. So, you know, he could definitely do well at the, at, and, you know, obviously combine results don't reflect how well a player is going to do. A guy could be an absolute combine freak and completely suck it up in the NFL. See, you know, guys like Tony Mandarich, Jonathan Baldwin for Chiefs fans out there. He was a combine freak. Didn't exactly pan out in the NFL, did he? But, you know, overall, these, these combine results, people like to see them. So, um, other notable guys, you know, Ernest, Ennis Rickstraw did not have a good combine. He was supposed to be a high-ranked cornerback. High he looked slow. Um, he didn't look all that great in pass coverage um, and just kind of – might fall by the wayside because of his combine results. Um, guys that rose from Missouri, I believe. So guys that rose from Missouri, uh, Harrison Mevis was a guy that played really well. Uh, Javon Foster also uh, was another guy that really shined at the combine. Um Something that happened, though, with Missouri running back Cody Schrader, uh, he injured his hamstring during the 40-yard forty yard dash. Um, it wasn't very fast doing it either. Um, Tyron Hopper, you know, didn't impress all that much. Um, and Darius Robinson did okay. Nothing spectacular. Um, and it's just that, that Cody Schrader one, Kind of makes me sad. I, I really root for Cody Schrader. I think he's a great kid uh, with a ton of promise. I think he runs super well. I think a team that's going to pick him up will be getting a great teammate, a great teammate, a great player. Um, he is a bit undersized, though. He's a bit slow, and he's probably going to be a late round pick to undrafted. And with this hamstring injury, you know it's unfortunate. I don't know the severity of it. As of yet, um, but hopefully it's nothing too serious and hopefully it doesn't impact his draft stock. Overall, I think I don't think any of the local schools have like a first round draft pick, maybe Cooper Beebe, um, but he didn't impress at the combine too much. I mean, he had a good 40 um, and kind of bench pressed okay from what I looked at, but I mean, overall. I don't see any 
first round draft picks. Uh, I think Cooper BB is the best shot at a first round draft pick. Maybe, you know, Javon Foster um, or the, yeah, maybe, maybe Javon Foster, but overall it's, 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 it's looking like a lot of the guys are going to go day two. So be on the lookout for day two. If you're a fan of the local college kids, um, I know that there are a couple guys like I, I think Zach Zabrowski uh, is trying to test in uh, for the NFL draft. That or he's staying another year. I can't remember for the life of me. Um, but local guys will get picked. It's just I don't see any like marquee guys like uh, Felix last year. I don't even though I don't think he should have been picked in the first round. Um, and others, I don't see any guys like that, um, going off the board in the first round. So we'll see what happens though. Um, obviously Rake Straw was picked in the first round, um, in a couple mock drafts as well as, um, as well as a Javon Foster too. So we'll just have to see. All right, let's get into some Chiefs talk, shall we? Uh, we kind of went into the combine a little bit, so this is more going to be like who I think the Chiefs should draft. Um, more on that, by the way. Obviously, I just said it. Um, but as far as offseason moves go, I mean, there's a little bit to talk about. Obviously, they franchise tagged the franchise bleh, franchise tagged Legarius Sneed. They franchise tag Legarius Sneed um, and are in talks with Chris Jones. They got about 10 days before Chris Jones becomes a free agent. Nothing for nothing, but I think they need to kind of hurry. In fact, they have less than 10 days because the league year starts March 13th, which is when free agency starts. Um, so they got a week, a week to do something with Chris Jones. Um, I'm confident that they'll get they'll, that they'll get a deal done. I think a lot of people are saying and hearing that they'll get a deal done. Chris Jones even wants a deal done, so I'm not quite worried yet. But you know, he does want thirty million dollars, and the moves that the Chiefs have made so far have not freed up that cash. You know, the, the MBS release did free up a bit. You know, good on them. And, you know, the Matt Ariza signing was not expensive at all. Um, but you look at Chris Jones and the situation that we find ourselves with him right now. Rat's going to probably need to come to the table and restructure his contract again. Which is why a lot of people were hesitant about that contract in the first place. Is, you know, is he flexible? Yes. Is he going to be flexible for very much longer? after being promised a lot of that money? Maybe. You know, he's on a 10-year deal, but the issue is that she's kind of have to make a decision here, I think, because I don't think there's really a whole lot of a chance that they keep both Legereus Sneed and Chris Jones. Um, which kind of brings me into the burning question of what I asked you guys of if you were a GM and you could only make one of these moves, which would you rather make? Sign Chris Jones or sign Legereus Sneed? And here's kind of here's kind of what you guys what you guys said. So let's 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 jump into that real quick.
So looking at those numbers, and quite a few of you voted in this poll, mind you. A lot of you vote voted for keeping Chris Jones and signing Chris Jones. I don't blame you. I am kind of in that same camp. However, Legereus needs one of the better corners in the league. And while I agree that Brett Veach has done a fantastic job at signing corners, or not signing corners, drafting corners, and really bolstering the secondary with guys that can play ball, like Trent McDuffie, like Joshua Williams, like Jalen Watson, etc., like LeJarius Sneed. What kind of precedent does it set when you're choosing other guys over your perennial, you know, star corner? Because that's what Legereus Sneed is. I mean, Legereus Sneed has played his butt off ever since he got here. I mean, he's been stellar. And... What does that say when you choose to franchise tag him and you choose to sign a guy who has made it incredibly difficult on your camp for him to, you know, stay with the team and has has just caused all this unnecessary drama because his agents told him to, essentially. You know, what does that say? I, I, I think Chris Jones needs to get rid of the Cats brothers. Obviously. I think everybody in Chiefs Kingdom thinks that. But a lot of it does fall on Chris Jones of, you know, are you in or out? And Legereus Sneed has expressed multiple times, I'm in, I love this team. I want to stay with this team. And yeah, Chris Jones has two to a degree. But after what happened last year, is there no like distrust? Are we not seeing distrust this year? You know, I, I, I think it's a long shot that a deal gets done for both, but it's still possible, I guess. But... That means more restructuring. That means more unnecessary drama. And the root of it all is kind of Chris Jones. And what he's done. And I struggle, you know, obviously he's the defensive centerpiece. Chris Jones is. He's, he's been a stalwart. And he's going to be a first ballot Hall of Famer. I'm, I'm just going to call it right now. He's in all likelihood going to be a first ballot Hall of Famer. And that's something that the Chiefs need to pay attention to and respect. And that's something that keeps them coming back to the bargaining table. However, when is enough going to be enough? And you're going to put your foot down and say, look, are you in or are you out? Because, frankly, this is getting ridiculous. And if he continues to cause drama throughout this week period of negotiations, because they're at the table, they are, but if he continues to cause this unnecessary drama, if he continues to bow to the Cats brothers' whim, and I get it, there is agents and everything, but you got to be willing to stand up for yourself, dude. You got to be willing to find a balance between, you know, the money and staying with your teammates, staying with the city that loves you, that adores you. Because again, you're kind of screwing us over if you continue to do this. And I'm not saying, you know, Chris should take a weaker deal to to Secure Legereus need. No. 
Earn the money that you've earned. And he's earned a lot. He's earned the payday of the highest paid defensive lineman. But there's only so much the Chiefs can do. And the Chiefs, from what I've heard at least, have offered him that $30 million a year contract. which is what he's projected to be paid. What more do you want? Especially, you know, when you're actively inhibiting the negotiations for another player. Another star player at that. And I get it, you know, NFL's all about money and everything like that, but... The, the loyalty's got to count for something, right? I don't know. I, I, I frankly, I, I, again, I agree that if I had to choose one, it would be Jones. But I mean, the drama's gotten ridiculous to this point. When, when are the Chiefs going to put their foot down, especially if Jones continues to haggle them? Even after, you know, they put everything on the table. I just don't know. I, 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 I have I have my sincere reservations about Chris Jones and his camp. But again, we'll see what happens. I I'm not confident that a deal will get done to keep both of them here. Plus, you know, guys like Drew Tranquil, um, Nick Bolton will be needing a new contract soon. Um, guys on the offense that will be needing new contracts. You know, Creed Humphrey, Joe Tooney, potentially even Travis Kelsey. You know, the the, the Chiefs. And the and Chris Jones have to keep have to come up with some solution, and a solution that causes in a and something that causes this drama to cease. Because frankly speaking, it's gotten so old, and I think a lot of Cheese Kingdom's done with it. But at any rate, oh, by the way, I uh. Have a year on Reddit today. Happy year on Reddit to me. It's called a uh, cake day over at Reddit. If you haven't followed my Reddit, go follow. Again, I'm sorry for the shameless plugs. I'm sorry. Let's 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 talk the draft. Let's talk the draft. I apologize. Um, so the draft. You know, obviously, you need to build up your wide receiver room. I know you won the Super Bowl without with with with, with Walmart cashiers. As plus Rashi Rice, as as wide receivers, um, and you know MBS did what he could, I guess. You know, thank you for being a playoff asset and not much else. But you know, you 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 have to have to build that wide receiver. I mean, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You have to find a competent tackle. You know, Wanya Morris is going to develop further, but you need depth at tackle. You know, Donovan Smith's probably gone. Um, uh, 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 Jawan Taylor might be gone too. Who knows? I it, You have to build the tackle position um, and potentially even the guard position, depending on what happens with Joe Tooney. Uh, Joe Tooney's getting up there in age, so you, you just need to build your offensive line. Um, and, you know, I said it last year, but it even rings truer this year. You got to find a tight end to back up Travis Kelsey, too. Yeah, like Noah Gray, he's great. And I think he will be a good Kelsey replacement after Kelsey retires for at least a few years, but you got to find your guy that will really be that guy for you again. I think Noah Gray can do it because he's shown flashes, but 
he's also getting up there in age. So, you know, it's best to find a guy right now, a rookie, that will be productive. And then, of course, you know, you find yourself in a position where you potentially have to get a corner if Legarius Sneed walks um, or is traded or anything like that. Um, potentially, you know, building up the defensive line, the linebackers too, if your tranquil walks. There, there's a few positions of need for the Chiefs that I think could easily be filled. I mean, there's a ton of great wide receivers in this draft. There's a ton of great corners in this draft um, and some pretty good offensive line talent as well. But overall, Brett Beach needs to show why he's called one of the better GMs in the National Football League. In, during this draft. This is a litmus test for Brett Beach. You know, the past few drafts have gone pretty well. You know, we can we can forgive and forget the Clyde Edwards Alaire debacle. Um, you know, he was fine. He wasn't a first round talent, but he was fine. Um but you really have to prove yourself with this draft. You gotta find the guys that are going to be a part of that next generation once Pat enters his twilight years, essentially. Um, God, we're really getting that old. Pat's been in the league for seven years now. Goodness gracious. Um, but, yeah, I mean, ascent, uh, straight up, like, you got to find your guys that'll be there for the next seven to eight years longer when Pat enters his twilight. So, you know, it's that it's that point. And I think Brett Beach can really prove his mettle if he can pull that off. Um, I think, obviously, you know, the three Super Bowls speak for themselves. Um, he's been excellent, borderline legendary. But I think this will be just another way to prove that he belongs among the best GMs of all time. So work that beach black magic. Um, as for me, though, I will be doing a mock draft here in the next uh, few days. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, I will be releasing it in article form here in within like the next week or so. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, hopefully you guys will enjoy that. Um, let's get into some current news and then a few minor things, and then we'll wrap up. All right, let's talk about the Kansas City Current. Uh, there's a lot of people that are not very happy with the Kansas City Current right now. Um, and that is because of... Well, thing called parking, stadium parking. We've talked about it with the Royals. We've talked about it um, in regards to their new stadium controversies. But the Kansas City Current felt like they wanted to join in as well. So essentially what happened in a very basic description and summary. So the Kansas City Current have a new stadium, right? That's going to be located, or it is located now, it's built. Um, it's located off of the Berkeley Riverfront Park. It's right off of uh, where that's located, over by the bridge. Can't miss it. It's pretty visible, to be honest, from the bridge. Um, so they built a new stadium. It looks gorgeous. It's one of the only women's soccer only stadiums of its kind. Um, and it is a testament to where women's sports are going. And I am very, very proud that that is in Kansas City. But what happened regarding this new stadium? About a week ago, 
was pretty crappy on their part. So they revealed after, you know, all the season tickets were sold, after their schedule released, like I, their season begins here in like two weeks. After all that, they revealed that parking, which was free, mind you, at Children's Mercy Park, will now cost will now cost fifty dollars for everybody, not just like the premium parking people and all that. For everyone, it will cost fifty dollars. I mean, that that's just as bad as Arrowhead parking. What what is the what is the thought process, especially releasing that information so late? What is the thought process here? Like, obviously, you know, it's a busy area. It's it, it's downtown Kansas City, and compared to downtown or down by the Legends, you know, it's a little busier, but not by much. I mean, I've been to current games before. I've driven down to current games before, and it's kind of chaotic so it it gives me anxiety that there is this sudden charge when you have all these people that have bought season tickets, when you have all these people that are super excited to watch women's sports, to to get involved with this team that has had success in the past, that is that is proving to be a trailblazer in women's sports, and all of a sudden you drop this on them. I mean, it's 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 disheartening. It's discouraging, and that's what a lot of the public has said regarding it. And KC Current has, as far as I know at least, said nothing regarding it. They haven't, you know, been like, okay, you know, this is why we're doing this. You know, this is our reasoning behind it. And they haven't said anything about potentially taking it back. Because, I mean, there's been such backlash on this. And I'm baffled that KC, the KC Current hasn't really taken action regarding this. So I was, so I'm hoping that they take action at some point. Um, obviously, you know, you got a little ways to go before the season starts. So there is time to change this. But it's it's tough to see. And again, disheartening. Um, but in some good in some good news, they they look primed and ready. To play this year, um, obviously they got the Bina back, uh, and they've got a lot of key players back as well. Obviously, they've seen a couple key players go too, but they should be better than what they were last year. Uh, obviously, you know they saw some key wins towards the end of the season last year. It was pretty disappointing though. Um, the year after they, you know, went all the way to the NWSL Championship, they kind of fell apart. Um, so you're hoping to see a better team this year, and I think you will. So that's a plus. Um, I have the chance to go to the scrimmage this year, or yeah, this this season. It's going to be on Saturday. I don't believe I'm going to be able to go. Uh, fortunately, I work during that time, so fortunately, I probably will have to pass on that. But I do have a couple guys that are going um, that I know that are going. And I'm hoping to hear a good report from them. 
so overall, there's good and the bad. But starting your season with, hey, we're going to drop this parking charge on you and then just say nothing is not, not an ideal way to start the season. But that doesn't affect on the field play. That affects off the field stuff. That being said, off the field stuff can affect on the field stuff sometimes. So we'll see what happens. I feel like I've ended every segment with that saying. So hopefully I'm not sounding redundant and repetitive. But let's get into some minor news and we'll wrap up. All right, let's let's finish this off, shall we? Let's let's finish this off. A uh, few other minor things. Uh, Sporting KC started their season with a draw with the Philadelphia Union one to one. Um the Union aren't a bad club, so that's respectable. Um, obviously, you know, with soccer, it's a little bit more unpredictable. There is a bit more parity with soccer, um, just given the ebb and flow of the game, I suppose. Uh, don't know why I did the hand signal there, but, you know, it ebbs and flows a little bit more than, say, football or basketball would. Um, you kind of, I don't know, just there's, I don't know what I'm saying. I'm tired. I apologize. Um, but the Royals, uh, spring training update, they're kind of killing it right now. Uh, which the Royals have done in the past and then proceeded to not be very good in the, in the, in the freaking regular season. But, you know, it is promising. They've produced a ton of offense. Every game that I see is like 8 to 7, 9 to 8, 13 to 12. That being said, <laughs> where's the pitching at, guys? You know, got to got to have some pitching. Um, so there's that uh college baseball season's underway. Uh, all three local teams look solid. Uh, K-State probably is the best of the bunch in terms of college baseball, um, but obviously we're still pretty early in that season, so we'll see what goes on there. Uh, Kansas has had some good wins. Missouri has also had some decent wins. And overall, I think it should be a good college baseball season too. Um, Kansas City has their first ever professional pickleball team uh, that was announced uh, via KCTV five. I don't know what they're called, but I'm, I mean, I know that there's professional pickleball, but I guess that's cool. <laughs> pickleball is the the sport of the future, I guess, according to rich investors and my uh according to my grandma and Claire. <laughs> hey, it's a fun sport. Don't get me wrong. I'm not talking any smack on it, but as someone who plays a sport that I would like to get into the limelight, i.e. rugby, which I'm about to talk about, um would like to see that get a little bit more recognition. Yeah, whatever. Um, but yeah, the Blues. Uh, the Blues started practice this week. Um, got another practice tomorrow. If you want to come on out, should be a good time. Seven to nine. Uh, every Tuesday, Thursday. Come on out to the Casey Current Training Facility off of 635 if you want to see what it's all about. But um, other than that, you know, just a few channel notes here. I will be also, on top of my mock draft, uh, be putting together a bracket challenge. So be on the lookout for that. And I'm thinking about doing a live Q&A here in the next few days, next month or so. Um, so that that might be the Burn KC two-year anniversary special. 
because uh, my two year anniversary is coming up of having this show, which is pretty wild, I must say. Pretty, pretty wild that I've been doing this for two years now. Goodness me. Since 2022. Maybe you should add that to the logo. We'll see. We'll, we might do a Burn KC redesign. I am not a graphic designer by any stretch of the imagination. Any stretch of the imagination. Um, I think the logo looks kind of cool, but I think I could do better. Um, but we might be doing a logo redesign, too, as well as a live Q&A for, 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 for the two year. So be on the lookout for that. But that's our show. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, this has been a massive show, I feel like. So strap in and sit tight if you're, or thank you, I guess, since you've reached the end. Um, thank you for sitting in on this show and enjoying it and reading my articles and just supporting me. Um, I don't think I thank you all enough for that, to be frank. Um, but seriously. Thank you so much for watching. This has been the Burn KC signing off. Have a great night.